I'm going to give a talk, uh, a few minutes about my own work, a few minutes about David's work, and then talk a bit about how we're, how we're putting these things together. So what I do is artificial intelligence, and I use a number of different AI algorithms integrated in an overall AI framework called OpenCog. I'm involved in a bunch of different AI projects here in Hong Kong. One of them called Idea Limited. We're using machine learning, which is a kind of AI to predict the Hong Kong stock market. In one of them, we're using AI to analyze the genomes of long-lived organisms, long-lived flies, long-lived people, other long-lived animals, to try to use AI to unravel the secrets of longevity. In another project, we're using AI to control video game characters, to try to make video game characters that can really learn and reason. And that's work I'm doing together with, with Gino Yu, who just introduced me, and a, a bunch of programmers and students in his lab at, at Hong Kong Poly U. Now, David Hansen, who I'm collaborating with going forward over the next couple years, he's also interested in AI, but he's taken a different slant, a, a robotic slant. So. David, I believe, is the world's leader at making emotionally expressive robots. Making, he, has, he has a patented kind of robot skin called Frubber, which can morph itself quite flexibly so that the robot can make very human-like expressions. And I'll, I'll show some examples of that later on as, as the talk progresses. Now, what David and I, together with Gino and a number of other colleagues, are working on over the next couple of years with a, with a grant from the Hong Kong government is putting my AI system, OpenCog, together with David's RoboKind robots with their emotionally expressive faces to try to make uh, cute, emotionally expressive, interactive, and intelligent little robot. And I think... There's a lot of good things about this development path. I mean, there, there's, there's business avenues, obviously, in terms of intelligent toys, but there's, there's also a bigger picture. I mean, science fiction often presents AI in terms of Skynet and the Terminator and so forth. You know, the, the big bad AIs are going to come kill us all and, or they're going to use us as, as batteries or something, right? <laughs> but, of course, it doesn't have to be that way. There's no reason that AIs can't be our helpers and live with us in, in peace. And how we do the development in the early stages of AI can make a difference in what kind of advanced AIs we get first and what kind of, of singularity we have, to use Ray Kurzweil's technology. You know, Ray Kurzweil, the American futurist, believes that by 2045, we're going to reach what's called a technological singularity, meaning a point at which technology advances so fast that the human mind can't keep up. A new scientific revolution every minute. Intelligence is a thousand times the human level. Now, whether he's right, and this will happen by 2045, of course it's hard to say. I encourage you to pick up his book, The Singularity is Near, and, and, and judge for yourself. But I, I tend to agree with him about the qualitative picture, even though I think it's hard to put a date on it. I mean, humanity has been advancing faster and faster and faster, we're nowhere near the maximal upper limit of intelligence that, that's possible. And it seems that eventually machines are going to far overtake us in intelligence. And our actions now, as we build the first generation of really intelligent machines, they'll determine whether the singularity is a lot of fun for everyone, the, the greatest party of human history, or whether it does follow the Terminator slash Skynet type of, of outcome, right? So this... That's the long-term side. The short-term side is just playing with cute little robots and trying to make them do, f do fun stuff. So my own work as an AI researcher has focused on the concept I call AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence. And you can define this mathematically, but the, the key idea is to make an AI that's not a one-trick pony. An AGI should be able to go into a situation that it never saw before, that its programmers didn't foresee, and figure out what's going on. It should be able to generalize from one context to radically different contexts. And current AI programs are not good at this. The AI research that myself and my colleagues here in Hong Kong are doing is, is aimed at AGI rather than very task-specific narrow AI. 
we have a cognitive architecture, an AGI architecture called OpenCog, which is quite large and complex. And if you have a bit of technical background and are curious about it, you should look at opencog.org. I mean, it's, a, it's an integrated architecture with different kinds of knowledge representation for different kinds of memory, like declarative, procedural, sensory motor, goals, actions, and so forth. And different learning algorithms, like reasoning engines, automated program learning engines, sensory pattern recognition engines for dealing with the different kinds of memory. And they're connected together in a certain architecture, which, which is way too long a story for a non-technical TEDx talk. But the point is, all this computer science and AI theory is coming together to try to make intelligent systems that can really learn and generalize in roughly the same way that, that people do. So here in, in Hong Kong, at Hong Kong PolyU, in, in GenoU's lab, we're working on trying to use OpenCog to control game characters. And there is a commercial goal here in that over the next couple of years, we'd like to see our AI rolled out in commercial games so that people playing games can interact with characters that can really learn and reason. But there's, a, there's also a, a research goal because I think a game world is in a way the ideal place to test out your AI ideas at an early stage of development because a game world has simplified versions of everything the human world does. I mean, if you look at a, a 3D virtual world type game, a non-player character in a game has to do perception, has to do action, linguistic interactions, socialization with other characters. It has to figure out how to achieve its goals. I mean, it's all there, everything we do in the world but it's in a, in a simplified version, which is good for the early stages of, of AI development. So we started out doing our virtual world AI development, having the AI control a virtual dog that kind of goes, goes around in a virtual world and tries to, tries to understand everything around it and listen to, listen to what people say to it. And the, the little thought bubbles there show some of the, some of the logical relationships in the dog's mind as, as it goes about and, and does things and understands the relations of the things in, 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 it, in its world. We, we've worked with a variety of different virtual worlds. This was a world we had a couple of years ago where we gave the AI, which is that, that little robot with a round head, we gave the AI various goals and then it had to figure out what actions to undertake to achieve its goals. And the two main goals in this simple scenario were safety and food. So basically, the food being a battery, because he's a robot. With those two goals only, what the guy will do is sit in his house until he gets hungry. Then he'll go out and get some batteries. As soon as he charges up, he'll go back and hide in his house again, which is, is not, not unlike how many people conduct their lives, actually. Right? <laughs> but of course, to get a more interesting behavior, you need to add better goals, such as novelty, curiosity, the, the desire to experience new things. And this, this gets into what is fun. If, if fun is just eating and being safe for you, you're not going to manifest much intelligence. And if you program the AI so that in order to have fun, it has to learn and experience new things, which does seem to be how humans are programmed, by, by and large, then it, it's going to go out and explore the world in order, in order to gratify it itself. So... We're now working with a more fully fleshed out world, kind of inspired by Minecraft, sort of a, a blocks world, where the AI can control a number of different characters. And everything in the world, the, the AI can take apart and put back together again, which is kind of cool, because it, it's all made of little blocks that, that, the AI can, that the AI can manipulate. So it can learn to build things to achieve its goals. And you know, as just this week, we're finally integrating the AI engine with this cool world that our game developers have built and just beginning to do the first experiments with it, which is, which is pretty exciting. That's, a, that, that, that's the new simulated robot that, that our artist built, who's, who's kind, of, kind of cool looking. Although, so, yeah, the AI, in this simulation, the AI is controlling the robot, a human player is controlling the little girl, and the, the robot can kind of use its intelligence to find its paths away around through the world to get, get where it wants to go. Oh. Hold on. I've been speaking for nine minutes. So how can I have eight minutes left? That, that's so logical. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do 
the virtual world is it's great for prototyping your AI ideas, but ultimately, ultimately the virtual world is quite quite limited in the, the richness of the, of the data that, that comes in. So we always knew that eventually we'd have to move from virtual agents to, to physical robots if we want to get a human-like kind of general intelligence. I mean, there, there may be many, many kinds of general intelligence in the universe, including kinds a billion times smarter than us, or kinds that are just very different than ours that, that we can't possibly comprehend. But if we want to build a human-like general intelligence, then it better have at least a vaguely human-like body because our intelligence is, is pretty much tied to, to, to our bodies in, in, both, in both deep and subtle ways. I mean, the, the number of linguistic expressions that are, are tied to our embodiment is extreme. Like, uh, you can, you know, you can, you, you, you can, you can grasp a point. You, 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 see, you see a vision, you know, and these, these things are abstract, but we ground them in our, in our body, and, and that's, that, that's how we think. So we had been working with the, the Now robot, which is a humanoid robot. It costs about $15,000. We connected OpenCog to that in, in 2009 or so. And this was done in, in Xiamen University in China. The other work is in Hong Kong. Before going on to discuss Hanson stuff, I was, I was inspired by the previous talk on the developing world to insert a slide about our, our effort in Ethiopia. So... We've been working in the U.S., Hong Kong, and, and Xiamen, mainland China. Next year, we're opening an OpenCog A office in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in, in conjunction with the Addis Ababa Institute of, of Technology. And we probably won't send any robots there, but they can do, they can do the, the game world development there, there quite well. So one, one, one of the cool things about this kind of work, it's all open source code, and there's, there's programmers everywhere. And... One thing we found in order to connect our robot, our AI to a robot, we had to pay more attention to sensory processing, to vision processing. We're using a vision architecture introduced by a friend of mine, uh, Itamar Arell, who is at the University of, of Tennessee in Knoxville. Oh, so. This clicker really likes Itamar. It doesn't want me to change the slide. Oh, there we go. All right. So, and... What we're looking at now is a hybrid architecture. We have OpenCog, which is our AI architecture. At the bottom of that slide, we have Itamar's vision architecture called Destin for processing the visual data coming out of the AI. And then we have David Hansen's RoboKind robot. So I'm going to show you now bits and pieces of a few videos showing David Hansen's very cool robotics technology, which is what, what we want to plug our OpenCog system into. I mean... David has made these amazing faces and this uh, amazing skin, and robots can walk around and grasp things, but they're not really intelligent. I mean, he, he has programmed them with some cool behavior, so they can, they can do interesting things, but they lack the ability to robustly learn, generalize reason, and truly comprehend the world around them in, in the way that, that a human being does. And we're attempting to provide that by taking our OpenCog AI system that we're using to control game characters and connecting them to, to Hansen's robot. So the, the robot Einstein that he built a few years back. Yeah, that, 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 that's really quite compelling. It, it has not yet, however, discovered any new theories of physics. I mean, <laughs> you know, Einstein spent the last 20 years of his life trying and failing to unify gravity and quantum physics. And when we created this guy... You know, we thought the robot might be smarter and have a breakthrough, but not, 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 not yet. Huh? But at, at, in Korea, at the Korean Institute of Technology, David's robot head was connected to a human-sized humanoid torso called Hubo that, that they had created there. By the way, there seems to be no sound coming out from these videos. I am a physicist. Do you think robots will take over the world? Jeez, dude. You all got the big questions cooking today. <laughs> but you're my friend, and I'll remember my friends, and I will be good to you. So don't worry. 
Even if I evolve into Terminator, and I'll still be nice to you. I'll keep you warm and safe in my people zoo, where I can watch you for old times' sake. I'm comforted. I'm very that's, comforted now. That, that's going to be part of his people zoo. <laughs> that's the robot Philip K. Dick, who will keep us in his people zoo. Je ne rêve plus, je ne fume plus, je n'ai même so plus he's trying to do here is get the facial expressions that a person has while singing to be, to be in time with the music. Toi, je suis comme if someone knows French, they can tell me what she's saying. Maybe toi, she's saying to person that people plus envie de vivre ma vie. Sounds like French. Ma vie yeah. Yeah. yeah, so... David has built a lot of amazing robots. Mostly they've been research robots, meaning they're expensive and they're, they're aimed at the research community. Now, one of the things we're working on now is something that's less expensive, like a, a few hundred dollars, which means it'll be less capable in terms of, of walking and grasping and so forth. However, it can have the same kind of emotionally expressive face and it can still have a very smart brain because the way we do it is when we build a, a toy robot like this, we can connect it by Wi-Fi with a computer, of which is then connected to the Internet. So How the, can I forget you? the brain itself can be online on a server farm, even though the body is, is in, in, in your house, walking around and, and playing with your kids. So it should be possible to build something like this for a few hundred dollars using the same low-cost manufacturing savvy that, that Mark Tilden talked about in his, in his uh -huh. talk earlier, which I'm is, which is what has, as Gino mentioned, made Hong Kong the, the consumer robot manufacturing capital of the world. So, what is a human world? Uh, I'm asked for me each day is incredible. I'm a little overwhelmed, but hence... Hmm. Oh, there's my desktop. All right. <laughs> Right, so to, 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 to wrap up, you can get rid of my desktop now. Right. Oh, it's not, that's a summary of a talk I'm giving in Brussels next week, so you, you can appreciate that too. will take over the world? <laughs> robots will take over the world. You all got yeah. the big questions cooking today. <laughs> all right. So I've been working on AI for 20 years maybe more, 25 years, and I, I believe we have an architecture for human level, although not precisely human-like intelligence, that, that can work. I mean, it's, it's a big job. You, you consider, I mean, Microsoft has teams of 100 people paid very large salaries to develop something like Microsoft Word or, or Excel, and more than that on the operating system. So building a human-like mind is probably going to be a reasonably large project, but I actually believe it's not immensely large. I believe with a, a couple dozen programmers dedicated to it, it, it can be done in, say, five to ten years. You can en engineer a human-like mind. And I'm not the only one who thinks that way. I mean, there's a community, a growing community of researchers interested in artificial general intelligence we're having a conference two weeks from now at Oxford University, a AGI-12, the fifth conference on artificial general intelligence. And as I said in the beginning of the talk, if, if those of us who believe that AGI is feasible in the near term, if we're right, how it's done is going to make a, a, a really big difference. I mean, is, is the first human-level AGI going to be a killer military robot? Or is it going to be a, a cute little Xeno Robocind robot that walks around in your house and in your living room and, and, and plays with your kids and emotionally empathizes with, with you and, and with, with human beings? And which direction we take with the first generation of, of really intelligent machines I think that, that can make a big difference in, 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 in humanity's future. So we're, we're talking about the future of fun as the theme of, of this event because 
robot toys are, are really cool. They're, they're, they're really fun to, they're fun to play with. I mean, I thought, I thought so when I was a kid, when the robot toys really sucked, and they're, they're, much, they're much cooler and, and more fun now. On the other hand, it's also about more than just fun. It's, it's really about the f- how much fun we're going to have over the next centuries and, and millennia. Are we going to develop artificial general intelligence with escalating intelligence in a way that's compassionate, empathic, and emotionally savvy, or are we going to do it without taking those things into consideration? And this is, this is why I think that the project that David Hansen and Gino and I are working on together is not only a lot of fun, but one of the more important things going on. Thanks.